Okay, hi everyone. It's Maria here from the Maria Sumbalov Project and the Radiant Woman Movement. Um, our goal for this lifetime is to help people move through and transform their so-called emotional pain points, which can stop us, all of us, from living um, our life to our fullest. Now, some of you have already done some work with us, and uh, in any of our projects under this Mary Sumlov Project umbrella, um, you will have come to expect certain things of me, but some of you are new to our work, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who we are and how we operate. So you will find that most of our work is actually soothing and even healing for you. Um, however, some of it will be confrontational. But just to put your mind at ease, we never push people to go further than they are ready to go. So how do we do that? Um, it's like I've been quoted to be like the big sister of the current gender work scene. And uh, what that means is that, is that it, like any other big sister, I'm not a perfect person. And I am not always right, but like any sibling, I can tune into what's going on for others around me. And from this place, if something is not right for you, as you would with your sister, you can tell me to bugger off. You can stop this work at any time. You don't have to listen to another word. You can just go ahead and um, do what's right for you. Because this work is all about you and who you are. So... Today we have the absolute pleasure to speak with a courageous woman who has overcome a narcissistic relationship with her ex-partner. And I suspect that also she's had other narcissistic relationships in her life. Um, she's now healing that wound and moving on to more nurturing and supportive connections. Hi, Dawn. Hi, Maria. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm really, really well. Thank you so much for joining me on this call. I just, I, I just feel so strongly about this. Uh, with my own father having been a narcissistic alcoholic, and and I've had narcissistic relationships in the past. I think that this is a really important, this um, voice that needs to be given to people around the world. So I feel so blessed to have you on this call. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me, and I am definitely ready to have a voice. Oh, beautiful. Oh, I'm getting chills. <laughs> thank you. So, um, <laughs> do you mind if we just go straight into it? Do you mind telling us a little bit about the narcissist in your life? Um, do you want me to tell you about all of them? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, perhaps, did you have narcissism in your family, in your birth family, your parents, maybe your siblings? Um, yeah, my mom, she was a narcissist, and, um, the actual, like, idea of a narcissist is kind of more recent to me, because, like, knowing, like, who they are and pinpointing them, um, yeah. now that I'm on my healing journey, but anyway, my mother, um, looking back, and still is, um, one of the biggest narcissists that I know in my world, um, so it sort of trained me to um, to be where I'm at uh, and to allow more narcissists in my world, I feel. Yeah. Um, but my more recent one um, is a marriage that I was in for 13 years. And I, I always knew something was off, but I was manipulated so, um, so intensely that I really just didn't know what was going on, but I knew something was off. And yeah. so that has ended, and I'm on my journey to healing and discovering more um, about what's real and what's not, and about what my, what my world, um, wh like honoring my world in my own view, um, apart from somebody else forcing their beliefs and ideas onto me. Wow, that's amazing. It must be such a, I mean, obviously it's a frightening space because for the first time in your life you're learning who you are and what you're about. and who, like to, You're actually learning to have a personality of your own, independent of any, any other person. And I think that also, I, I, I'm not sure how it was for you, but it sounds very similar to how it was for me, that I found that having that conditioning as a child... Um, like anybody's childhood experience, the child always thinks that this is normal. 
So we yes. can't even question it. And it, it's like it's almost like there's this awakening at some point when you realize that other people are not being treated the way that you're treated. And you kind of go like, well, what's going on here? Like, what is actually happening here? And you begin to ask those questions that, challenge what you've always believed was true absolutely and it's it seems that um especially when you have a parent uh, who is a narcissist that and and you don't even question what is going on or how you're being treated because you think this is normal you don't even um then when you get out of the home the conditioning is so strong that you almost feel a sense of association with it, which means that you feel safer with narcissists that that than normal people in commas, non narcissists, because it's familiar. Did you yes. have that experience? Absolutely. I um and you know they they I, I still I still have I have I know that I, because I have that in me, that I still draw the narcissist towards me. Yes. Um, it's like a magnetism. Um, it's like a polar opposite from what I am. And we just naturally are drawn together. So I know there's a lot of healing that it needs to take place and is. Um, but it's, it's, I definitely felt at home. I felt at home regardless of how painful um, the narcissistic situation or the reality of being in it was, but it just felt so familiar um, yeah. that it's really difficult to know that it's, or even recognize it as being wrong. That's right. Because it's not wrong, because it's the normal thing. Absolutely. Yeah. How could you know any different? You don't. You don't know, and often... There's a almost like a shame aspect to when you do awaken. You don't want to tell people because you should have known. You should have known. Absolutely. Absolutely. But how can you know? You can't know something you don't know until you know it. And then you can go like, oh, I've been, you know, I've been <laughs> um, taken for a ride. But, of course, a lot of people who do... Uh, who are surrounded and gr br brought up by narcissists become actually very strong people. They have a very um, long, um, abil a very like extended ability to tolerate bullshit, actually, in people, to be direct. So we tend to be almost like peacemakers, or we tend to be like, oh, but I understand where this person is coming from. There's a lot of understanding of other people's behavior um, without judgment, and this can be to our own detriment, of course. Have you had an experience where you've almost like justified somebody else's behave bad behavior, uh, even after you've realized that they're a narcissist? Honestly, Maria, I, um, I used to do it all the time, up until recently. Um, I used to justify uh, people would tell me blatantly what somebody had done, or even in my own world, I would know that it was wrong. Yeah. And I would say, well, you know, it could have been, th this could have been the reason why they did that. You know, I would just have all of these different scenarios yes. um, in order to justify their behavior. Um, and, and, and that's just how I've been operating for years and didn't even realize that that it was in a lot of cases harmful and that people should be called out on their stuff, you know? Absolutely. Um, and that there is a right and wrong. Um, and I've been made to believe there is no right and wrong. Everything just is. Yes. Um, and so, and in, and so it's, it was hard for me to determine what was right or wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't know in the beginning because you actually, don't know what is real and what isn't when you're starting this journey. So just to um, just to explain a little bit to people who are maybe not that familiar with the narcissistic personality type disorder, narcissism is a, is a disorder where uh, a person treats others as almost like pawns in their own game rather than uh, than treating them as living, feeling like real people. Uh, narcissist sees uh, another person just as a tool or as a as a means to an end for something that they want or they 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 choose 
a person that will play a specific role in their own story. So the story that the narcissist has going on is not necessarily congruent to reality. And a lot of the times narcissists don't have many friends. They may have like followers and so on, but they don't have many real friends because people often call narcissists on their shit. And because narcissists can't uh, accept that their world isn't the reality, they tend to move from people to people in quite a, quite a, um, uh, in a, in a very easy way, in a really easy manner. So, um, um, what has been your experience, Dawn, in um, this? Because there's almost like a sense of isolation that this person, firstly, they put you on a pedestal. Um, they just think that you're the bee's knees. And then when they realize that you're actually not perfect, as they have defined, then they isolate you and begin to uh, categorically break your spirit and break your reality and and insert their own reality into your life have you uh, what is your what what's been your experience in terms of the whole um putting on a pedestal thing it kind of feels really nice for somebody who's never like for me i didn't feel important for most part of my life and uh, when I came across these narcissists and they put me on a pedestal, I felt so important. Did you ever feel this? Did you ever have this experience where you were put on a pedestal before it all went to shit? Um, honestly, I was put on a pedestal for about 12 years. About 12 years. Um, on and off. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of putting me on a pedestal and then disconnecting. Putting me on a pedestal, disconnecting. Um, on my um, ex-partner's um, part, and a lot of it being so that I wouldn't really see the person that he was, and so I would constantly be loved bombed through poetry and, and gifts and um, food and trips and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, and, and so it would... It, it wouldn't um, allow... Like, any time I would start to see what was going on... Um, he was really aware of um, of of my energy, yeah. um, and he would pay attention to that. Um, and so he would know um, how to bring me back into his world, into his That's right. um, distorted reality. And so he was really good at like paying attention to my body language, my um, emotions, uh, all of that. Uh, and he knew how to keep me where he wanted me at just the right, the right temperature and the right, um, the right place. Exactly, and that's the, one of the problematic, one of the biggest problems I think in terms of trying to get out of a narcissistic relationship is that narcissists are very intuitive. Yes, and, yes they are. And and the reason why they are is because they have to be because they have. They learned very early in their life that they had to perform for other people to be accepted. So narcissists don't actually have a sense of who they are at all. And that's why they're doing all of these stories. Because they're trying mm -hmm. to figure out or they're trying to assert who they think they are. Um, and a lot of these stories that narcissists tell are these grandioso um, massive, oh, I've done this, I've done that in my life, but then when you actually go to check on it, it's not true. But they continue to feed this story and enroll you into it and start getting more angles onto it. Um, and, and I feel that, uh, like, I can certainly echo what you just said about um, the hot and cold, the pedestal and then withdrawn. Um, that's certainly been my experience as well. It's almost like um, um, your... They, keep you at an arm's length until you no longer need them and then they pull you right in again so it's like um it's like they push you away they try to to have the control of that relationship by pushing you away and then when you go like okay i've had enough then they love bomb the hell out of you so that you'll keep coming back so it's this almost this like reeling in and out <laughs> yeah <laughs> to get out yeah. of that dynamic so uh, tell me yeah. about that in your own experience. Uh, I call it whiplash now. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I, you know, um, in my experience, so you're at, 
Can you ask me that question one more time? I got a little sidetracked on the whiplash thing. Sure, but it's such a perfect example of, because it's like um, you're being yanked back into it, like somebody puts their hand down uh, up at your um, neck and just yanks you back into their reality. I, I totally get that whiplash thing. It's such a perfect way of explaining it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it, it, go ahead, sorry. No, please go ahead. Um, I just, in, in all honesty, it's like an emotional roller coaster. Yes. Um, you, you, you don't know, um, you don't really know if they're hot or cold. Um, and because you've been love bombed, like say you just had an episode of love bombing, yeah. And um, and then they decide to pull away and yeah. keep you at arm's length. It's really confusing. So you're you're constantly in a state of confusion. Yeah. Um, I would say heartbreak, um, okay. along with um, feeling full for a little while. Um, and so it's just it's very quite confusing. And for me, there was a part of me that didn't want to look too closely. Uh, I don't know why, but I I just, I couldn't look. And maybe because it was just familiar to me, I didn't know how to look. I didn't have the eyes to see until now. I really don't know. Um, I don't, it's, but it definitely is an emotional roller coaster for sure. That's how I felt like it was. It is, and also if you're being brought up by a narcissist, that's kind of, we're, it, we're almost like we're addicted to that emotional roller coaster. We just, it feels so familiar and it feels safe, even though it's very taxing. Um, yes. So just to go back to the, the point earlier, it, we don't know anything else and it just feels familiar. And knowing that you don't actually have to live on that emotional roller coaster for most of your life, it takes a lot of strength to see that as you said you didn't know how to see or what to see or even how to look at, at what was going on or you know how things were affecting you but at some point you kind of just run out of steam and you can't do the whole drama thing anymore the drama kind of like um wears you down and you tend to get sick or you get to like i got burned out i know people who've had narcissistic parents who uh, then have lived this roller coaster, this emotional seesaw thing for most of their life, and then they end up with uh, like adrenal exhaustion or some other form of exhaustion. They're just done. And then if you don't have anywhere, any kind of um, a way of realizing what is causing you this exhaustion, you might get a sense of, ah, oh, I'm just, this is just too much. It's just getting to be too much. And that might be the first trigger for most people to even look at their relationships. Yeah. It's like you have to be dragged through the dirt. Um, for me, I, um, in, in, in all honesty, I could still be um, under his, um, his wing. Yes. Um, but I saw myself continually going down. And I had been, my heart, my mind, my, like, everything, had, it just felt like it continued to take such a large beating and it was getting worse. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, I don't know why, but I'm done, like, I just have to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm going to get out of this alive, like, not in the way that I've, I, I was not in, a, like, a physically dangerous relationship with this one, but... Um, if I was going to have any sense of just a little bit of self yes. um, or dignity or, um, or just um, – there was just a point where I just snapped and it, everything kind of clicked for me, and I was like, I, I have to get out of this. This is not yeah. normal. There's something very, very wrong with this. Yeah. And even if I have to stand alone for the rest of my life, I'm done. I'm out of here. Yeah. And um, cutting the cutting the narcissist off cold is the only way that you can do it because there's nothing to make sense of that situation with them at all. Absolutely. And exactly what I was saying before, because they're so intuitive, they know which rope to pull to get the reaction that they want. So even having a little bit of uh, connection with them is, is just often doesn't bring the desired result, which is to discontinue having a relationship with this person. 
Absolutely. What makes it difficult is that I have a child with this person. Right. And so I have to get really, really good at um, setting boundaries and being right to the point. Um, and I've had to do a lot of energy work around um, him coming by and, and dropping off my child. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's something that I continue doing, um, a lot of energy work around um, keeping him out of my space, my energetic space especially. Absolutely. And it's that whole thing about um, the your inner child so you're effectively you are self parenting your inner child so your adult self is parenting your inner child to set those boundaries and sometimes the inner child has um, kind of it gets so triggered that the parent is not able to um, hold or, or contain that inner child that the child just comes out and it's those times when you're really triggered and your inner child is running the show um, that makes you really vulnerable when you're trying to cut off a narcissist from your life. So whenever you're, um, my advice to anybody who's dealing with narcissists is always only to have the inner parent deal with the narcissist. So don't let your inner child be vulnerable around this other person who's been feeding and, and manipulating that inner child. For quite some time, in your case, certainly. Right, and you know, it's it's the the adult self um, stepping up to the plate and um, and protecting that um, that beat down child, the one who didn't have a voice, yeah. and you know, um, taking that child in your arms. Um, and really just embracing that child and being the protector and just saying, no, no more. That's this is correct. not, well, no, this is not okay. You will not ever be able to harm this child again. That's exactly and that's, that's something that I work with daily um, yes. because I, you know, reclaiming my power Yes. Um, and reclaiming my voice when, you know, even going back as far as I could remember when I was a little girl. And that's been extremely helpful, too, um, when dealing with narcissists. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a daily thing. It, it is like any form of conditioning that we received as a child. We are now conditioning our child in order for... So basically what's happened is when you're a child of a narcissist, your inner child, so you as or you as a child don't ever know what's coming around the corner so you get ready to kind of jump into action at a moment's notice whereas when you're self-parenting so that the child or you as a child learned to be on guard all the time and now and that's your conditioning and now when you're starting to parent yourself or when we start to parent ourselves we need to condition ourselves to feel safe and it's really hard absolutely we don't know. That is because especially when you don't know, when you didn't have a parent um, or parents that actually taught you healthy boundaries and a healthy sense of self and love, you have to go into that blindly. And that's why we, we have had the narcissists in our world. That's why we've had abusive, been in abusive situations. Um, because we don't, we, we don't even know where those healthy boundaries, um, what they look like, what they feel like, how they should be or shouldn't be. Um, and so it's really, really just standing up for you and being like, this hurts me and I'm just done hurting. Like, I'm not going to do this anymore. And so stepping into, um, like, who you would want your, like, who would you have wanted your parents to be and how would that have felt like? Exactly. Um, I, I love yeah. I love that because, um, you know, when you're, you know, who who are your effectively adopted parents? Can you um, look at the qualities that you would have liked to have had in your parents and study those and begin to give those to yourself? So begin to give yourself that sense of safety that you never had. We don't know how to even get it. The only way to learn is through other people's example. And that's when it's really good to... Um, Make sure that you're not following a narcissist when you're looking for parenting models. <laughs> well, because what happens...
happens is that there's those empty spaces that we don't know about ourselves that the narcissist comes in and fills and it feels good because we need that guide and we need that teacher we need that parent and we need somebody to like make us feel safe and loved and so therefore energetically it leaves us open to the narcissist to the person who has this reality that they share with us and they inflict on us that's so wild and so out of this world and it's almost like it's really kind of intriguing yeah. that we know that there's something off and dark about it um and so it's and we we don't know any better we just don't and and it's and and unconsciously we were welcoming in we, we've welcomed in those types of people because we didn't know Absolutely. And I mean, this is a really nice bridge on to the next subject that I'd like to talk to you about, which is gaslighting. Um, oh, God. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know what gaslighting is, uh, gaslighting is a form of mental abuse uh, in which information is twisted or spun, selectively omitted uh, to the favor of the abuser. And um, they, they can give false information and it's presented with all the intent of making victims doubt what their own memory or perception or, or even in some really hardcore cases, you begin to um, doubt your own sanity. It's like, uh, you know, I'm, am I just insane? Like that question, I am absolutely like 100% of people that are working with me uh, um, through this narcissist wound have asked themselves this question, am I, am I crazy? Is it me? Like, I, yeah. I must be crazy. Tell me about your gaslighting experiences. <laughs> you know, I laugh about it today, but honestly, like, I've had, I, I, I have a personal life coach who's an intuitive um, root healer. And um, she's been really helping me to, because I have that, I do the same thing to her, and I'm like, am I crazy? Like, at first, when my first session with her was back in um, September, right. and where I was literally, like, so messed up in, in every way. And, and sorry, um, I, just for the listener's benefit, it's now May, so this is less than a year ago. Yeah, please continue. Yes. Yes, thank you for that. Um, and I, I and, and still to this day, uh, I ask her, am I crazy for thinking this or feeling this way? You know, because it's like you get so, um, you doubt yourself so much because they know, like you were saying, gaslighting makes you doubt your own reality, makes you doubt your own intuition. Um yeah. And in my situation, it was like, I know damn well he would say something to me. And then um, and then I would tell him, you know, later on, hey, this is what you said, but yet your actions aren't matching up. Like, what's the deal? Yeah. And he would say, no, I never said that to you. And then he would, like, he would, he would in a sense, like, manipulate the reality and to make me believe it was me and me question my own sanity. Yeah. Um, and, and that was a constant thing. And I got to the point where I'm like, what's, what's the point in trying to call him out on his stuff or even have a conversation? Um, because I knew that, that if it wasn't him, then it had to be me. So I, it was like, I, I call it putting a child in the corner sort of thing um, and and telling that child that they're bad and not helping them work through it. So I felt like um, when when I when gaslighting was going on for me, which I didn't know that's what was going on at the time, but I felt like a little child in the corner um, and, and not like, okay, well, you're telling me that because I'm presenting this you know, this commitment or this situation that wasn't honored or a commitment that was broken and we need to talk about it. But yet there was never any acceptance on his on his part. And so therefore, um, because of that, he would talk me into believing that it was always me. That's so, um, yeah, and, and I was the one that was questioning my sanity and I was the crazy one and all, and, and if I even tried to present a situation um, to him that I knew wasn't right, I, 
he would know how to manipulate me so intensely that literally I was like shaking in my knees and yeah. um, and I knew that I didn't want to feel that way so there were points where I wouldn't even I wouldn't even um, I would I would just let things go and I would be um, basically the one dealing with my own um, and his stuff too. I would take on his stuff and and basically be in the corner with it, trying to figure out how I could how I could uh, go on. Absolutely, and it's it, it is almost like a um, or a people who are used to and who have been parented by narcissists certainly tend to do this later on in life as well. We take responsibility of the other person's feelings. And, yes. and we take responsibility of their actions because we are conditioned to do that. However, when you stop doing that, you are so alone with it. You are so alone with it and you need to go outside of your, especially if it's a relationship, you need to go outside of your relationship to talk to somebody who is um, completely neutral, doesn't even necessarily know you or the other person, but actually just explain the situation to somebody who's not going to take sides. Um, so, so talking to your friends, friends can be counterproductive because people have all their own agendas and all that kind of stuff. So working with a coach or, or, or a spiritual healer like you are, asking them, this is what's happening, what is actually, what, what am I actually doing? And the great thing for, for, from the narcissist's point of view, the great thing that they do all the time is they're so skilled at uh, sensing where you're at and manipulating that how they need to manipulate it to make you feel the guilt that they actually should be feeling. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. That gave me the chills. That is very true. Yeah. It's, and, and you we tend to get, we, we feel the guilt, we feel the emotions that they should be feeling, but they're not because actually they're not physiologically capable of going there because it doesn't support their story. And like, you know, we can talk about narcissists and say how horrible they are and all that kind of stuff, and they are. It, it, is, a, it is abusive to be in a relationship with a narcissist. However, we all determine the level of abuse that we're willing to take or not take, and when we draw a line, we draw a line, and we need to do it for ourselves, not because somebody else is telling us to do something. We need to finish relationships when we are ready to do so, and when we are ready to do so, it sticks. It's like quitting smoking, <laughs> any bad habit. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to want to do it, but uh, if you don't know what's happening and, you, you know, you continually keep taking responsibility for somebody else's feelings, um, it's really hard to see what is actually right for you, and especially that guilt that a lot of narcissists are really good at throwing at you, um, and that shame, there's so much shame, it's like, it's you, and what is wrong with you, what's wrong with you, there's something wrong with you, I'm perfect, there's something wrong with you, for you to see it this way. Yes, and, 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 in all honesty, in my last relationship, um, the, the words, what's wrong with you, um, it wasn't, because he was so good with words, like they very, very intellectual thing, that he would be so sneaky about the way that he would go about making me think that, yeah. um, that it was hidden and it was very, like, um, it was done in such a way that was very sneaky and I didn't realize what was going on until now. Absolutely, and often they are also done in a way, those things are inserted um, into conversations, um, especially with people who are sensitive like ourselves. I know I'm sensitive and I can feel that you are too. That it's not, it's not, it doesn't even have to be said. The message is loud and clear without even having to use the words. It is all our fault. Yeah. We are the ones that are broken. And, and, and so are you saying that we are, or they were saying that to us, or that was what they were projecting onto us? Yeah, their message to us is that we are yes. broken. We are the ones yeah, because, that have Right, and, and because they, they have all the answers and they've come to a place of, um, you know, where they've figured it out. And, um, you know, and also the main line that was used in my situation to corner me was, what inside of you doesn't accept that this is really what's going on? Oh, my God. And, Kill me. Yeah, yeah. And that was a... that. 
that have me? Because it's a very tricky thing. And I'm like, okay, well, hmm, maybe I need to come up with a, a way that I should accept that. Then it's obviously within me. Um, and so that was like the famous line in my situation um, where it wasn't like, oh, well, there's obviously something wrong with you. Because I, that would be that would be a lot easier to, <laughs> to pinpoint, you know, to, um, to realize that, yeah, like, okay, buddy, whatever you say. But the way that it was done was so sneaky and so, yeah, I mean, it just had me, just some major gaslighting going on. Wow. Yeah, that's a massive one. And especially when somebody's saying what inside of you is blah, blah, blah. And my response to that is, well, the fact that I'm hearing your bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah when exactly. in, but when you're in that situation, you don't see it. You don't see it coming, and you think it's a genuine question. And it's actually not. It has nothing to do with getting an answer out of you. It has to assert. It has everything to do with asserting dominance. Absolutely. And and I want to I want to throw something in there. When you're in a romantic relationship with a narcissist, um it's extremely hard because what happens is when a woman is sleeping with a man and it's been for, you know, uh, in my situation 13 years, um you're energetically very connected with them and you become but like foggy and, and so it's harder to especially when you're so used to being love bombed and you're you're having sex with with your partner um it makes it really really hard to um to realize what's really going on and to really see it and understand it but um and and I'm surprised like I'm surprised that anybody even comes out of this shit because it is like yeah. Some real intense stuff, especially when it's your lover, especially when it's your lover. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And the whole thing about cellular memory as well, um, I don't know if our, all our listeners know, but our brain is not the only place in our body where we um, store memory. We store memory in all of our cells, in our muscle cells, in our blood cells, in our, um, you know, in our tissue, in our connective tissue, our bones, all the cells in our body store memory. And especially for women who allow or who uh, prepare their private space for the man to arrive in, physiologically when you're having sex, um, yes. The person inserts themselves into you, so you're opening this private space for a person to enter. And that person is leaves cellular memory in our very private creative parts. And that is something that a lot of people don't know, how affected women actually are by the arrival of the man into their sacred space. So it's very, it is, I would absolutely echo what you've just said, Don, about when you're having sex with your partner who's a narcissist, it fogs you. It fogs you because now a part of you holds memory that actually thinks that this is real. This other person's memory is now inserted into your cells. And especially because it's such a creative center. So whenever it comes to your creative power or your own personal strength, especially as a woman, um, that space is now compromised. That is a very, thank you for going into detail with that, because that that is very true. And that's something that I'm really working on as well, is clearing out, like, you know, my, my past partner, um, his energy from my womb, um, because it's, you know, after so many years, it's I know that it's still there, even though it's been months that I haven't been with him, um, it's still there. And especially and since you have a child together. Yes. You have kept yeah. a part of this person in your person for nine months. Yes. Big deal. It's a cellular, cellular uh, memory and trauma-wise, it's a big, big deal what you've gone through. And, and, it's not, and that's one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm so proud of you. And I don't mean that in a condescending way, like as if I'm somehow better than you or any of that stuff. Nothing like that. But if I was your sister, I would tell you how proud I am of you because I can see the efforts that you've actually had to, to make to get out of a situation that is so um, stored in yourself and has been for a long time. So you are such a beautiful, 
strong person. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. That's I really appreciate that. Yeah, and and for anybody who's coming out of or even just has a, a um, an inkling that something is off, I would just say like get some help and and when you know and talk to somebody that actually knows something about it um so that you don't feel like you're crazy for even thinking that something is off because in my situation i did i thought i was crazy for thinking that something was off um that something wasn't right and so um coming out of it it's i have to say that it's a huge breath of fresh air i'm so grateful but i also and and being in relationship with a narcissist it's you, you crash and burn a lot and even being out of it it's like there's this feeling of like thank god but also like oh my god you know that's right what's next because the unknown can be even worse than the known absolutely and i often say yeah i couldn't agree with you more and i often say to women as well when they're trying to move on from a relationship that one of the best ways of doing that consciously when you're you know when you're single you're moving away from a, an abusive relationship is actually to sleep with somebody else but to do it consciously to sleep with another person that um uh, opens up that energy or or you know a, a, an extended period of, of masturbation or whatever that opens up that energy inside your private space and you you can now release the cellular memory and then replace it with something that is actually true for you now so when you know when women say to me oh I, i'm so attached to my ex i can't get over it i can't x y and z unless there obviously if there's some um history like i had history of sexual abuse in my childhood if there is then this is not exactly the right piece of advice for you but for most women who haven't experienced sexual um uh, abuse in their childhood or don't have sexual issues i often say you know have you considered um just ha going out there and having fun and having a bit of sex with somebody that you know that is actually just there to fulfill that role of uh, uh, scrambling that, that sexual that that, 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 that um, uh, uh, cellular, cellular memory in your private space, space and, and and so you can release it and then rebuild it to be more um, of a um, healed um, transformed space for um, a person to arrive who is now worthy of of that space because it is right. the memory is just so ah oh, underestimated you know uh, you, you know you hear yes. stories about somebody getting a heart transplant and then them feeling really close to the person the people that were in the in the life of that person who uh, um, donated that heart doesn't that what yeah they have memory they have memory and and sometimes we need to and especially energetically and 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 the transformation of cellular memory from that point of view we need to scramble it up to release that stuff and then consciously replace it so i'm not saying go out and have sex with everybody and then get all needy because you're not now getting the validation anymore from those people i'm not saying that at all yeah yeah but what i am saying is do it consciously choose to say okay i'm going to go out and hit the reset button here and and if you can do it with somebody who's safe even better yes i agree i agree <laughs> But isn't it interesting how um, um, this is obviously because when we're, you and I are talking predominantly about narcissists as males, males and in, uh, from a female's point of view, but female narcissists are, are just as bad. I mean, I've certainly had clients who've had um, their husbands or partners be seduced by narcissists to have affairs and so on, and it's just the whole. It's, it's all about the story for the narcissist. It, you, you need to keep a tap on what's actually real in your life and not be, not get fluctuated uh, or not start fluctuating between different realities just because somebody's giving you a bit of attention. Absolutely. I, I feel like we need to be, um, it's really important that we are observers of others and to really have a strong sense of self. And I know, I know that um, 
that's not always the case in some people's situations. But for me, I, I feel like I didn't have a strong sense of self and I'm working on that. Um, and I feel a lot stronger in who I am. Yes. Um, so you're not easily swayed and you're not easily manipulated because, um, you know, the narcissist can sniff out those types of people. Um, and I feel like now that I'm stronger and my boundaries are stronger and I have such a strong sense of self, I'm not swayed. I'm not easily swayed. And I'll, I'll gather information, especially about, you know, new people that are entering in my world. Um, and they'll tell me things, but for me, it's what are your actions behind your words, you know? So, a talk is cheap. Time will, yes. tell. Time, time will tell what the reality of any situation is. And things that are not meant to be um, a part of our lives will eventually play themselves out if you just allow it enough time. Um, yes. You can just um, arrive to a space where you're solid in yourself. Um, and you can just let things play out as they need to play out and not, not make anybody else's actions mean anything about you in particular absolutely and and i and i also want to add with the narcissist they're really good with their words because see they're really great intellectually and um and they're good at like you were saying you know they're um they're really intuitive and so they they're just really great with words but their actions are so off and if you just, if you watch people, then you'll be able, and not to say that everybody that's actions, you know, don't match up with their words are narcissists, but, you know, if we just observe for a while, you know, the, those, those people, then we would have a heads up and our gut would tell us when something's off and we, we don't second guess it because we're learning to tune in and tap into that. Um, yeah, yeah. Not to feel yeah. Bad, and not to feel bad about letting time pass and letting things play out. So not not buying into that whole thing. Oh, I need to know right now. Because once you accept that actually the, nobody else's um, behavior determines who I am, then you have all the time in the world. Right. You can just let it play out and see what happens, and then eventually it will fold. It will fold if it's not right. But getting out of a relationship with a narcissist, now, that is, because what I just said is actually um, when you're thinking about getting involved with somebody or when you have new people coming into your life, you can just let things play out. But if you're in an abusive relationship then with a narcissist already, then obviously waiting to see how things play out. Yes, it certainly gives you a chance to uh, strengthen yourself, but eventually you will come to a point of... Um, it comes, it comes to a head, and, and you will have to make a decision openly, and, and you, you will have conflict, conflict. Um, <clears throat> when things end, especially with a narcissist. So it's not to say, oh, yeah, just wait for it. If you're in a, you know, an abusive relationship with a narcissist, just wait for the rest of your life for things to... Yeah. No, 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 no. I was talking about if you're, you know, new people come into your life, just let themselves, you know, let them show you who they are rather than tell you. Let them show you who they are. Right, right. Yeah, if you're in an abusive situation, don't wait around anymore. You've had enough already. You've seen enough that it's not going to change. Uh, especially the narcissist is not going to change. Um, they they shape shift for sure, um, depending on you know the person and the environment and what you know their 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 need for supply is. But um, you know it's they're not going to change. It do, it doesn't happen. It won't. It can't. Yeah, I I I agree. And even if they were to change, they need to find it themselves. I've uh, spoken to a couple of what's called recovering narcissists. So they are self-claimed recovering narcissists, which means that they have been narcissists in the past and they have uh, begun to the healing journey of their own path. So it can happen, but the likelihood of it happening is very very slim. Um, and and even, even if it was to happen, to stay in a relationship where there is hope of something changing is really, you just continue to abuse yourself by staying in that relationship. Do not fall in love with the person's, um, 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 you know, what they might be, their, um, what they could be someday. Um, right. 
see the person who they are today and choose whether or not that is a, a reality that you want to live in. Very true. That is that is a great. Um, that's that's a really good thing that you just pointed out because for me, um, in my last relationship, he could surely you know talk a good. Yeah. Um, you know, talk talk a good game. Uh, but, you know, and it was the idea of the person that I fell in love with. Yes. And so, and, and that right there is a major red flag when they're telling you, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to change the world, and I'm going to, you know, and and it's like, have they done any of those things? Are they living it right now? And if they're not, and you've fallen in love with the future idea of somebody, that's, that's a major red flag. Absolutely. The potential potential doesn't mean reality. No, no. you don't match. It's reality is what reality is. Potential, yes, you can have personal potential. We all have potential to be anybody we want to be. That's fine. But are you actually taking steps towards fulfilling that potential? That's the real question. And it, and when people are, you, you you know, support them. Oh my gosh, support them. And they're going for things that really are important for them. And they're saying they're stating. You know, because some people do state things. I'm going to do this. And it, and it may seem, seem like, like a, I, I remember I read an interview about Richard Branson, Branson and he said, oh, uh, Virgin Cola, Cola is going to be the next big thing. thing. It's going to challenge Coca-Cola and, and all this kind of stuff. Now, obviously, now, obviously it didn't materialize, materialize but, but we've, we've seen Richard Branson, Branson materialize other, other things. things. So, so <laughs> just because something didn't work out exactly how it was that. announced, look, look at what else that person has set out to do and have they begun the journey towards it or have they fulfilled it and, and have they put in considerable effort to actually do so. Right. And also, you know, paying attention because uh, in, in my situation um, with my, um, my past partner, um, they, He's left a lot of people pissed off um, because they were only a source of supply and he could only get certain things from them. And then he would be done, abruptly done, um, and it would leave the person confused and, like, hurt. And um, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't step in and try and, um, you know, salvage any of the relationship, even after saying, you know, oh, they're such a great friend or they've done this or that. But he, but he got what he needed from them and left them high and dry. Yes. Um, and, you know, you know, and then making them kind of second guess if it was them, you know, if it was them even in the end. And it's really a, 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 a fucked up situation. And I've seen, I've seen that destruction. So even if they do have... You know, you know things that, that they that they can show. You know, they're they're ta they're walking their talk. Um, what, what like what how, what how have they gotten there? And um and what kind of destruction have they left, especially in the lives of people? And um and 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 you know, do they even care? Um, because I've seen, I've seen in, in, you know, in my situation, people put a lot of money and time and effort into um, this person's venture, my my past partner's ventures, and and for them to just be shut off very cold, very quickly, and very confused in the end, and it's not fair. Um, and and me even and, and me even questioning like aren't you even gonna talk to them? They're obviously upset. And me being confused, you know, as to how somebody could treat another human being that way after, you know, being excited and supportive and in any way that they could. But they were only a supply in the narcissist world. Yes. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the thing. It's always a good thing to ask. How many friends does this person have that they've been friends with for more than five years? Yeah, absolutely. Because that's a really, or ten years. That's a really good question to ask. How many people are actually, I mean, if you've had a really fucked up childhood and, you know, you were bullied in school, maybe you don't have school friends. That's fair enough. But, um, you know, like, who are those people who are still in your life that were there ten years ago? I can, I can certainly say, say like, I don't, I don't have, have many friends that I trust um, because of my own childhood experiences. But I have, I, once I'm friends with people and they have 
in fact, proven that they are loyal friends. I have those friends forever. I have I hear I have friends from my like when I went to school when I was seven. That, that I met that, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah I met you too, but, too, but we're, we're on Facebook, and um, there's an understanding. And then, and then all of a sudden, I get a message. Oh, oh I'd so love, love to come and visit Australia, and, and, and I and I know, know exactly where she's coming from. So then, so then we have an in-depth in chat for a couple of hours on Facebook, and and it's it's perfect. It's as if nothing ever changed. In the meantime, she has like three kids, and freaking I live in Australia, and that's Finland, where I'm. Yeah. You know, so obviously everything's changed, but right. Nothing's, Nothing's changed, changed in terms of, of the sense of high, and, and that's it. <laughs> that's all you need. Yes. High. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I agree. I agree with that. Um, and and even if they have had friends, you know, for a lot. But how often? You see, this is where it gets tricky. Um. Even if they do have, say, like high school friends, mm -hmm. how how are they around them, and how often do you know? Um, how often do they actually get together, and how do they? I would say, how do they act around them? Yes, exactly. Are they the same person when they're around these people, these people, these people, these people? These people? I mean, of course, you, especially some of us who have public personalities or public personas, we are. When, when we're working, we're that public person, and then when we're in our private lives, we're we're a private person, and that's fine, and that's understandable. And I'm kind of, I'm actually trying to break that. I'm I'm trying to be as genuinely as my real self in my work as I am in my private life. But obviously, not everything is public information. I don't want people to know things about, you know, my relationship, for example. It's private. It's between myself and my partner, and it's you know, I want to keep it that way because I really. Um, love that sense of intimacy of, of not including other people in that but you know like but I could talk about sex in a workshop situation not necessarily don't want to talk about my private you know sex life but sex as a general thing and of course you know there are going to be times when you will be a different person for di to suit a different audience but but the question is I guess here are, is that person aware that they are deliberately a different person around other people? Like, are they? Do they own it? And can they say, yes, this is I'm doing this, and this is the reason why I'm doing this? So that it's actually a deliberate, um, conscious way of being um, at different level with different groups of people. But that's a really good question. How are they interacting with that group? Are they still the same person? Right. right, and 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 you know, with an overt um, as opposed to a covert. Actually, I would say let's do a covert as opposed to a, an overt. A covert narcissist, um, they struggle in crowds. They can be, um, they can actually be a part of a crowd for just a very short period of time. Yeah. Um, especially like if they're projecting their reality onto you, kind of like a teacher. Yes. Um, and then getting out quickly before having to really communicate and connect. Yes. Yes. Um, and in my situation, um, my, my ex-partner, he, he could be a part of something for just a very short time. Um, he was very, he would be engaged just for like very briefly, but then he couldn't, he couldn't stay connected and he couldn't, he couldn't connect from a real intimate, um, part of himself and so he would usually run off or he would take another car and leave early um and so and and that could be a completely different episode all in all in all in itself but it's the behavior is off it's very off yes um and, and it's recognizing like huh that's that's a little odd you know and paying attention to that Yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. And, I and I find that narcissists, especially in social situations, situations when it's about them, when the, the spotlight is on them, they're fine. But when it's not for, uh, about them, when the spotlight is no longer on them, they're not really that interested and they'll just move on to other things. Yes, they will. Or go hide out or leave or whatever, you know. Um, get on their phone, play video games. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about, before we wrap up, I'd like to talk a little bit about narcissistic rage. 
Um, okay. And, um, in, and just for our listeners who are not familiar with this uh, phenomenon, uh, narcissistic rage occurs when that core instability in that narcissist is being threatened because narcissists are actually unstable inside. So when that instability is threatened and furthermore threatened to destabilize them completely, so when somebody challenges their reality, narcissists can go into this rage. And it's, it's not unlike a wounded animal uh, that's being at its most vicious because, you know, they're being attacked and they're already wounded. The narcissistic rage occurs when narcissists believe that the next insult or assault to their grandioso um, way of being uh, um, would shatter their stability. So um, when narcissists are cornered and their shit, their bullshit is being called, they go into a rage. Have you, Have you had experiences of this rage yourself in relationships, or perhaps you've never even pushed it that far? Um, I, I was in a seven-year relationship um, before this last one where it was very vi it was violent. Um, and um, I have to say with my past, my, my recent relationship that just ended, um, it was more like on a mental, intellectual sort of like rage, um, and it would be done in such a way that um, I could feel the rage within him, but he would, he would, he, he just had a way to manipulate um, with words, so it was more like a rage with words, but yet not calling names and not doing that, it was just, it was different. But I have had, I've had the, the very rage-filled individual um, in a relationship where, like, my, my apartment would be completely destroyed and glass shattered everywhere, holes in the wall. Right. Um, you know, when calling somebody out on their shit. Yes. Uh, and so that was scary, um, but I, I wanted to get to the bottom of it for sure, but it is a scary thing because you're putting yourself in a very risky situation and endangering yourself and maybe others around you, which children were present at, at that time. So Yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. And also, um, I get that, like, that, narcissist, that kind of... Um, what you were saying that there's a difference between physiological violence and, or rage and, and psycho, psycho emotional rage and I often when I feel that rage coming from a narcissist or a person who's behaving or who's been triggered in a narcissistic way into their narcissistic pattern because not everybody like everybody is the narcissist to some extent but you know when people are um, um, triggered into that pattern um, I if they don't express it um, Ex ex externally, extra extrovertedly, so to speak, if they're expressing it psycho-emotionally, I always get this sense of loathing. That person is loathing me uh, for yeah. some reason. It's this kind of, it's this, even the way they look at me is like, yeah. You know what I mean. It, it doesn't. I do. Yeah, it doesn't have to be physical violence. It can be narcissistic rage. Can and it can. It doesn't have to be even verbal abuse. It can just be this sense of, oh my God, you are so nothing. Who the fuck do you think you are? I'm not fucking wasting any of my time on this bullshit without any words being expressed. Yeah, yeah, it's more of an energetic feeling, um, and it's an energy exchange between the two. Yeah. Um, and so it's it definitely you know that it's going on. It's just um, on a different um, on a, in a different level Absolutely. than being expressed outwardly. So you know, there's different um, there's different there's there's definitely different rages. There's different. It's just expressed differently and different, you know, with different people, for sure. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to um, just start wrapping things up for ourselves and for our listeners because we have a, a limited amount of time here. Um, but uh, this has been really, really amazing. And, and anybody who has listened to this recording, please, if you have questions, um, 
Email us at uh, coaching with Maria, coaching with M E R J A at gmail.com, or pop over to our uh, Facebook page at The Radiant Woman, and um, uh, where we'll be posting this. I'll be posting this uh, this uh, particular recording. And please share this with, with people in your lives that uh, might be in in a, in a situation that may not be completely healthy and and. We need to, this needs to be talked about. I don't. I'm, I can't tell you how much I have enjoyed and how much respect I have for you that you are putting your voice forward uh, for all of us to learn from. Thank you so much for your time. I, I'm I'm so honored. Um, do you have any final kind of uh, pieces of golden nuggets of, of information or um, or advice that you'd like to share with all our listeners? Well, first of all, I want to say that I am honored to have been asked to be on the show. And I really, truly appreciate um, that you've given me an opportunity to have a voice um, uh, on your show, so thank you, and I I really appreciate that. Um, and as far as uh, like a closing word, I would just say that our body is really really good with telling us when something is off, and if we really allow ourselves to be in tuned with that, um, and usually there we know when something is off, we just do. Um, but it's just getting to the point of, you know, questioning that and being open to see where it, it guides us. Um, and for me, that's that's kind of like how it how it was for me was that um, I knew something was off, and I knew that like um, that something was not right, and that I needed to start questioning and getting to the bottom of it. And I was scared. Um, and it, because it is scary once you actually wake up and start asking questions because you don't know where it's going to take you and your whole entire reality changes from that point on. Um, but all I can say is that it has to be so much better than where you've been, um, and where you continually are. Um, and even if it, it means standing alone for a while, um, it's so much better and it feels so much better to know that you're not the crazy one. <laughs> and um, it does. And waking up every day and just knowing that, hey, I wasn't the crazy one, um, has been this tremendous gift in my world that I, I didn't even know was there. Um, and so just being able to recognize that and, and, and waking up, I would say start asking questions um, and be open to where that's going to take you. Even if it feels a little bit scary, it has to get you to a better place than what, where you have been and where you are. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dawn. And just to remind everybody, you are not alone. You are not alone. There are people around the world who are having the same experience as you are. Do not be afraid to reach out. Seriously, we are all in this together. You have people in your life who can support you. So um, if you want to get more information on maybe you want us to talk about the subject more, please give us a message and uh, we will do our best to have the voice of all of these people who have been having this experience in their life and who, who have been, their ex life experience has been stunted or, or put a lid on by these experiences. You are not alone. We are in this together and let's do this. We can do this. We can have a voice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your time and thank you again, Dawn. And thank you, and, and thank you to all the listeners, and, and like you said, I'm, I'm here as well, and I'm open to doing some more work around this um, as I learn and grow through it, um, and still am. It's probably going to be a lifetime thing, but um, and I'm okay with that. I've dedicated myself to that, so um, anyway, thank you again. I, I truly appreciate this. Thank you.